What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Life Coach Zach podcast. I'm your host, Zach Rance, certified life coach, certified nutritionist, mental health advocate. I like to bring guests on here that are leaders in their chosen field, whether it's a doctor or nutritionist or maybe just another life coach or spirituality coach. And I'm just grateful for the opportunity that I can share it with you guys. I hope you enjoy. But how's your day going so far? Uh, good, man. Just running around all over the place, just uh, trying to tie some loose uh, ends with work and uh, get ready, making sure I get my pack list and checklist ready because I fly out Saturday. Nice, dude. I was going to say, don't be running around too hard. You got to stay off your feet because you got a big run this weekend. Yeah, I'm king of the taper. If it's one thing I'm good at in training, it's the taper. The taper. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, speaking of taper, I don't think I've trained for the past like 10 days before my half Ironman. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. What are your thoughts on tapering? Uh, I think it is really smart because um, it's an art like anything because I grew up a swimmer. So we always tapered before big swim meets. And it's it's almost like a car. You don't want to just put a car in a garage for six months because if you try to start it after six months, it's almost good that it runs a little bit. Not that you need to take it to the track before you race it, but you need to keep it healthy by keeping it moving. So you end up on, depending on what you're doing and your coach says, you end up in kind of like just like a little bit of a maintenance schedule where you keep everything moving and going. And uh, that's the best way to go into uh, any kind of like strenuous event or race in my experience. Yeah. So you're doing a Grand Canyon run. Can you tell us a little bit about this run? Yeah, of course. So I'm a bucket list guy to a fault. Um, I love experiences that take me out of my comfort zone from reality TV, like you've done as well, to things that I've done, to education, to sports and everything like that. And I grew up playing team sports. And when I graduated college, which I I played lacrosse, I didn't have that anymore. So I had this big vacuum to fill. So I started to get involved in triathlons, Ironman, um, and it just kept on. It's like probably like getting a tattoo. People, I don't have any, but I've heard. You get one, then you want another, and you kind of get addicted to it. So I got addicted to taking myself out of my comfort zone. So the Grand Canyon, um, I've done drive-bys, but I've never really done a lot of – I haven't actually toured it or spent a lot of time. So – I have uh, five buddies that are like-minded individuals, uh, also masochists, and we tried to do it last spring, but because of COVID, it got canceled or postponed. And I started researching and I saw kind of a thing that's popular amongst ultra runners is the infamous rim to rim, or if you're even more masochistic, rim to rim to rim, which means you go from the south rim of the Grand Canyon to the other side, the north rim and back. Uh, depending on the trail you take, uh, which trailhead, it's about 48 miles. Um, significant elevation change. It's basically like an upside down mountain so or a soup bowl where you run down, it gets flat, wow. and then you go back up. And there's significant elevation change. And as a result, significant weather and temperature change. So it'll probably yeah. be based on the weather report. Uh, we're recording here. What, uh, it's the 22nd of uh of april so we timed it so we're doing it during a super moon um this is kind of peak season because it's in between the winter and the hot summer months and um again 48 miles it'll probably be 20 30 degrees on south rim and probably 90 degrees down at the bottom oh my god yeah yeah. um you know and i told my buddies because you know i got i'm probably i'm in decent shape but uh some of the guys I'm running with are younger and in the shape of their lives. And it's kind of the proverbial tortoise in the hair in that the young, really fit guys try to run out sometimes too fast. And I tell them, I'm like, listen, this is all about pacing. Um, If you do anything, maybe try to do more progressives where you start slower and in faster and kind of see how you feel. So it should take us probably about, 12 to 16 hours and it won't be a continuous run it'll be a run some walk some hiking um so we have the ultra trek running poles for a little extra stability saves the knees and the joints a little bit so yeah that's kind of the synopsis of it man dude that sounds incredible man so what are some of your expectations going into this because when you come back, we're going to do another podcast mm-hmm. and we're going to do a recap. So put some things on the record right now that you can look back on and uh, and see where it went from there. 
Yeah. So I think if I'm honest with myself and with your audience, it's, it's, it's more, and this has been my experience in all kinds of things. I don't know what I don't know. And mm. what I, and, and I know that if that makes sense in a weird way, I know to expect the unexpected as a cliche as that is, because although I'm probably the least fit of the guys, I probably have the most experience in the pain zone because of what I've uh, done in the past. So my brain and my body is like, oh, we've been here before. And I was just talking to one of the guys that is doing this run with me. It's made me appreciate when sports announcers for the Super Bowl be like, you know, the Patriots are older, maybe not as talented, arguably. And the Kansas City Chiefs, man, they got first round draft picks. They have Mahomes. And it, really, we think the Patriots have the advantage because they've been to the Super Bowl before. They've been here. They have the mental strength and experience to uh, have an extra leg up or advantage in the Super Bowl. And I was like, Psh, yeah, right. I'll go with the first round draft picks mm -hmm. all day. But I actually, you see like the Tom Brady, the Edelmans, uh, the Bill Belichicks, having that experience being there helps with anxiety, pregame jitters, you know, mm -hmm. keeping your cool and thinking straight during the last two minutes when you're down by a touchdown, all of those things. And I've experienced that, that, I know that I'm going to be in pain, arguably probably the most pain out of all of the guys because of my physical condition relative to theirs. But I just know that I'm, it's going to hurt. It's going to suck. Uh, you got to kind of embrace the suck as David Goggin says, mm -hmm. and uh, know that afterwards I'm going to be stoked and I'm going to love oh. it. And, and, and that's kind of what I would go on the record being like, I'm leaving it open that there's going to be surprises. And I think if you are have the mental mindset that there's going to be surprises. You don't get up as upset about the surprises. If that, if that mm. makes sense. Cause you're anticipating them. That's right. That's right. So what, so you always talk about this pain. Like what do you think is going to be the worst pain? Is it blisters? Is it just going to be soreness in the legs? Like, is it going to be out of breath? Like go into a little more detail about the, the pains you're expecting. Yeah. So there's that voice inside your head when you're doing something that is strenuous to this level where your brain's like, stop. Just stop, quit. You have a you have a mm -hmm. cramp in your side. My IT band on my right leg uh, tends to tighten up anytime I go out over like 15 miles. Um, so I'm doing my best to keep that stretched and nimble. But I know that's probably going to bother me. I know I'm going to be fatigued physically and mentally. Um, so uh, so yeah. So it's just kind of like keeping my my mind in in the right set and just keep moving. Honestly, you know whether I'm running eight minute miles or 13 minute miles, just the fact that you keep moving because, you know, before you know it, when you're struggling at mile 40, before you know it, you're done, you know? And uh, I say that with education and life and work that it, sometimes it's like a marathon, you know, signing up for a marathon's fun, training for a marathon can be fun, starting a marathon's fun, but you get to mile 22 in your brain, in your body, it's like, what are you doing? Why am I doing this? <laughs> you know, like what's wrong with me? But as soon as you cross the finish line, and it's almost uncanny, literally as soon as you cross the finish line for something like a marathon, you're almost immediately stoked that you did it. And you have like this overwhelming sense of accomplishment, you know, this goal that you work towards. And I just know that that's how this will be too. I'll be in mile 40 or 35 and I'll be like, why am I doing this? <laughs> like, well, I, I should be home with my feet up, drinking <laughs> Uh, a nice iced tea, watching sports on TV. But, you know, as soon as I finish and I'm with my buddies, we timed it during the super moon, like I said, and, and, and we hang out and we celebrate that night. It'll all be worth it. Oh, what's, wait, what's a super moon? Just a full moon or? Yeah. So it's just, uh, you know, this, it's almost like a harvest moon. If you've ever seen those moons that randomly happen and you're like, oh my gosh. It looks wow. like really like huge and bright. That that's the we specifically timed it so it's uh, during Dude, the Superman. The stars out there must be absurdly, incredibly beautiful to watch. Yeah, I can't I'm imagine. I'm excited because I don't think there's a lot of light pollution out there, so you should right. and, and will be high elevation. And if I didn't mention it earlier, we're going to be camping. So oh, wow. we're we're camping on the South Rim. We're taking, uh, we're flying in a Flagstaff. I found this historic train that started in 1901. We're taking that up actually to the South Rim. So we planned mm. like a whole, whole, whole event, uh, me and my five buddies. That's amazing, dude. So what's, what's the nutrition plan for the race and, and prior to the race? 
Um, so it, it, it's staying high. I, I've had a problem with hydration. Um, in the Ironman, I had hyponatremia. And if the audience doesn't know what that is, it's actually getting dehydrated basically because you overhydrated. And you drink so many fluids like water, for example, that doesn't have the sodium and electrolytes. Right. So your body just kind of flushes everything out. And um, it's a, it, you can die from hyponatremia. Your organs can shut down. You get tunnel vision. It's a, it's a dangerous problem to have, just like dehydration is. And I've been dehydrated. I was doing the David Goggins challenge in March and I was doing four, you did that yeah was it four miles every four hours or something yeah for 48 hours and um I got rhabdo and if you guys don't know what rhabdo is long story short it's where you're dehydrated and your kidneys can't keep up with the muscle lactic acid breakdown and not to be graphic but you pee coca-cola it's the color of coca-cola and I had to go to the emergency room and get a hydration pack and get my blood tested oh, because no. it's real dangerous. I didn't even realize it was how dangerous it was until a nurse friend was like, Ryan, you need to go to the ER. And I went to check in and they're like, yeah, you might be here for a couple of nights. That's what the nurse at check-in to said. I go, really? She's oh, like, yeah, no. your organs can shut down. You could have to be on dialysis if you like don't take care of it. So point being, my nutrition um, is obviously really important, but hydration is really something that I'm focusing on. I um, got a product called Tailwind, which has a product like for hydration, carbs, calories, all those things. And that goes in my camelback that sits on my back. So I okay. sip on that um, starting 24 hours before. Um, and I sip on that throughout and I'll probably have some solid foods as well. But Tailwind is specially formulated and there's some other products like it that it doesn't give you that gut bomb. Like if you ate like a, you know, a big meal or, you know, some other stuff. And so uh, we're going early so I can acclimate on the elevation and I'll start uh, ingesting some of that too. So my body's uh, up to par on it. Wow, dude. Well, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. That's I've right. heard that. Iron, and... sh iron sharpens iron. <laughs> iron sharpens iron. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And all those experiences that you went through are just making you a stronger man and it's helping you get through all the challenges and obstacles that you're facing now and that you're going to face in the future. That's right. Well, as far as we know, uh, we only go around this merry-go-round that we call life and earth once. Um, some people believe maybe it happens more than once, but as far as we know, it's once. So you might as well do cool stuff. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> what are some of the other things on your bucket list that you've, that you've done or that you plan on doing in the future? Um, so I, I, I I call it a bucket list, but you could call it a goal list too. So education's on it, you know, from college to MBA to I'm just now finishing my doc my doctorate in business. Um, I rode my bike across the country. I was supposed to be on Survivor and casting bumped me three days before I was supposed to fly out. And one of the reasons is they said they were between me and another guy and a real, a guy, I do real estate, as you know, but um, the other guy that was on there uh, before me tested really boring and he was a real estate guy and he had a similar psychology exam as I did and they were worried that I was going to be boring so and it was summer I had my whole work kind of planned out I had someone watching my dogs and I was like man screw casting I'm going to show them I'm not boring and I had uh, riding my bike on my bucket list so I hopped on my bike at St. Augustine and I rode to San Diego, 35 days. I grew a beard like Forrest Gump to make it more dramatic. <laughs> and uh, I raised money for my favorite dog rescue at the same time. Because I was going to do it. Dude, I didn't know that. You yeah. you rode your bike from St. Augustine to San Diego? Yeah, man. It was an absolute blast. We averaged about 85 miles a day. And we um, took a break in Austin and a break uh, just outside of Phoenix, I think. It was some little town. Wow, dude. I know, I'm a nut. I You're a should. nut. I should probably have my head examined. <laughs> you should have your head examined. Is there anything crazier that you've done than that? Um, I did Everest Base Camp, and then I summited a Sister Peak, and that was pretty crazy. It wasn't as tough as the Ironman, but it was mentally very taxing, and the altitude was a whole other animal to to manage. So that was, that was kind of up there as kind of one of the crazier things I've done, too. Dude, speaking of Ironman, I have my race in a month. Any last it. tidbits of advice for me? Um, make sure your nutrition is on point because I told you I had that hyponatremia issue. Um, and make sure you enjoy it, man. I, I think a lot of people get so worried about their time 
um, in, in all these other, you know, metrics and, um, they're data junkies and, and it's important to know where your heart rate is obviously and all that stuff. But, you know, I would look at your first Ironman as your first Ironman. And what I mean by that is don't get so caught up on like, Hey, you know, I'm, I want to finish on this time and then be upset that you're on mile 10 and you realize you're not going to hit the time really, really soak it in. If you wanted to like go for time and try to, you know, do something like that, not to say you shouldn't push yourself and have goals and, and work your way towards it on your first Ironman, but I would really just try to soak it all in. Um, I like the idea of being modest at the beginning of the race, see where you are. And if you want to start putting the hammer down ladder, uh, later in the race, then that, that's a good plan. Um, but I would say, enjoy the experience is my best mm. advice. And the other thing I tell my friends is that I did a half Ironman also as a tune-up the month before my Ironman in Cozumel. My half Ironman was the Miami one. And I did that in like five hours and change. And I had five wow. miles left in the run and I felt awesome. I threw the hammer down. I literally sprinted across the finish line. And that level uh, of hubris uh, basically came in. And I was when I was going to Mexico, even though I was training on coconut water and cliff electrolyte blocks, I was like, oh, I'll just get that when I get to Mexico. So I'm type B to a fault. I'm not type A. I wasn't super organized with like when I'm going to have this nutrition, how much, you know, coconut water I'm going to have. So when I got to Mexico, there was no whole foods. I couldn't find coconut water anywhere. So I was like, oh, I'll just drink water and Gatorade. Well, I just said my hydration issue. So that really kicked me in the butt because when you get into that high endurance distance place, any vulnerability really comes through from a, la a nagging injury to not stretching to improper hydration and nutrition. So just to make sure that's dialed in so you can also, like I said, soak it in. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Dude, I'm excited, man. I, I'm going to take your advice. I'm just going to have fun with it, not worry about my time. As long as I cross the finish line before the 17 hours is up alive, um, it was a huge success. And like you said, our iron sharpens iron. And since August, I've been training my ass off and it's leveled me up with my nutrition and my quality of sleep, my time management skills. Obviously, I'm in probably the best shape of my life, which yeah. says a lot because I've always been in decent shape. And, um, you know, I, I went on my Instagram yesterday and I was encouraging other people to get a race on the calendar, right? Like put a half marathon on the calendar, put a marathon on the calendar, give yourself something to work towards. And, you know, when people listen to this podcast and they hear all the incredible things you're doing, I know it's going to inspire them. And it's inspiring me to kind of just like get out of my comfort zone more so. So, dude, Ooh, I, I want to commend you for sure for it, all the incredible It's cliche, you but I think you really – I appreciate that. But it's cliche. I think it's really uh, the truth though that you really grow as a person when you take yourself out of your comfort zones in many different kinds of contexts. And you'll – you, you and I, you know, we'll, we'll talk again, obviously, after your Ironman, you're going to learn a lot about yourself because, you know, you'll have those voices in your head that tell you to stop and, and you just kind of push, push those down. You push those down and, and you have a lot of time with your thought in life. We are in the tornado, tornado of, you know, getting after it, raising a family, you know, paying bills, whatever. And I have a tough time meditating and I know you are a big proponent of it. And one of the most annoying quotes I've heard about meditation, um, and it's annoying because I believe it to be very true in my experience, is that the people that have the toughest time meditating are the ones that stand to benefit from it the most. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that. And it's it's like that book, you can't finish, you keep putting it down. I try to meditate, try to meditate, whatever. Running an endurance sport has helped me hit that meditative runner's high state where you go in and you have your breath. You have your movement and in, in Iron Man, you're not allowed to listen to music or a book or anything like that. No headphones. So I'm just, you're just going through it. You're alone with your thoughts. You're thinking about pushing yourself. So you have the naysayers that you're in, so your internal voice and monologue. Mm -hmm. And when you break through those proverbial walls, man, it, it makes you better in my opinion in everything and Absolutely. life and business and everything. So um, I'm stoked. I'm stoked for you. Dude, I appreciate that. And and to go back and piggyback off of your meditation experience. So the the and you're absolutely right with that quote. And there's another quote that I like a lot. It says, uh, everyone should meditate for an hour a day. And if you don't have enough time, you need to meditate for two hours a day. That's great. I like it. <laughs> right? Yeah. I love it. So 
Yeah, man, you're you're absolutely right. The people that like can't do it are the people that need the most. I mean, especially you. I mean, and I'm gonna do an intro once we get off here is to kind of tell everyone about you and, and give your background. But you know, you, you're a real estate broker. You've built a successful real estate company. Mm-hmm. You're getting your doctorate degree. Um, obviously, you're in high demand when it comes to events and things like this. And uh, I don't I don't know how you do it. What has been probably the biggest factor? And 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 you even said you're type B. Like you're not the most organized person. Like mm-hmm. how do you think you keep it all together? Um, well, you know, while we're throwing out cliches and quotes out there, you know, you've heard the saying. Uh, and I think you alluded to it with your schedule and training. If you want something done, ask a busy person to do it, right? Mm. A- and what I find is if I don't have a lot of stuff going on, maybe the real estate market's slow or I'm out of season because my real estate business is very seasonal. Um, I don't have any schoolwork to do. That is when I'm the least productive ever. And you would think it would be the opposite because you're like, wow, you have so much time to repaint the house or redo, you know, work on that project you were working on and whatever. What I find is when I'm really busy, that's when I'm getting, I just crush it. So, you know, there's a balance, obviously, it's that annoying balance word, right? Where you got to find, strike a balance on things because I have a tendency sometimes to have nothing on my plate. Then I put too much on my plate. I get burned out. I take everything off my plate and then it becomes like a cycle again. Um, So, um, but to more directly answer your question, I think that by just keeping myself busy, um, and goal oriented, um, that really helps me move the needle. And, um, you know, I'm a big sailor too. And in sailing similar to endurance sport in that if I had a cigarette boat, you know, I want to throw the throttle down, run over manatees, hair on fire, just get after it. And I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm, it's how quick can I get to where I'm going? Mm -hmm. Where in sailing, it's almost like as a sailor, you have a different mentality. It's like, you know, there's going to be issues for you to overcome during that race or that, that, that cruise. So you're like, hey, like when you mentally are prepared for obstacles, then I think that you approach them totally different. I remember um, your audience might be too young to remember some of this song. But um, if you remember that song, I can see all obstacles in my way. <laughs> yeah. Sorry for sorry for the audience having to hear my me being toned up. <laughs> uh, but but when you I, I was a little kid and I asked my parents, I'm like, why is that a good thing? Because then he's like, it's going to be a great day after that. And as part of the lyric and what my parents explained to me, they're like, Ryan, it's important to know obstacles in front of you. Like, that's a good thing. Because I was like, I always had obstacles as a bad thing. So it's always kind of like the context and the paradigm that you approach things, I think. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, man, I think staying busy. My former uh, mentor, when I first got in the business, my uh, former broker, I'd get home from a vacation or an event and he goes, all right, well, where's the next one? whether it was a vacation or another challenging thing. And I was like, well, what do you mean? I just got back. He goes, it is so important, Ryan. I don't care if it's a year and a half from now. Book it. You always need something to work towards and look forward to. It's a very important psychological effect. And I, you know, I kind of listened to him and I really, you know, took a lot of things he gave me advice to into practice. At a time, I don't think it resonated. But once I started following that advice, I still do it to this day. You know, I always ha- like to have something that I'm working towards, whether, again, it's education or travel or endurance or whatever. I think it's real important. Dude, so important. And and that's exactly back to what I was saying earlier about how I was encouraging other people to get a race on the calendar. I've already scheduled another Ironman for the Ironman that you did in Mexico, Cosmel, November awesome. 21st, 2021. Regardless of whether I do it or not, obviously I'm planning on doing it. Having an Ironman on the calendar makes me obligated to stay in shape. Like if I don't have anything on the calendar, I'm probably not going to go to the gym. But knowing I have a race in six months that I have to be in super tip top shape for, I have no choice but to keep my skills sharp, right? Keep sharpening the blade and um, moving the needle 1% more every single day. That's right. In the best shape of my life, I was always, and maybe it's part and parcel of my personality and or growing up playing organized sports, but I always had a tough time going to the gym just to have abs, like in just going out and pushing around weight with any like without any like real purpose of me doing it other than the aesthetic or the vanity in it, of it. So for me, I was like, man, I uh, would sign up for the race before I even started training because right. I was like that, right. like you, exactly like you said, I'm like, man, I better get my butt on the bike. I better not have that beer because I got that date and that thing coming up. And, uh, you know, it, it's if it if it didn't scare me it wasn't a good enough goal. 
Uh, you right. probably heard that too. And, and I always try to find things that scared me a little uh, because that was always kept me on my game. Absolutely. Well, yeah. Ryan, dude, we wish you the most luck, Thank safety, you. love, health, happiness, wealth, success for you, all your friends, your family, all the people you care about most, dude. You're an incredible guy. I'm happy that we cross paths and that we stay in touch as much as we do. Me too. Um, it was incredible having you on the podcast and we're going to do another one. As soon as you get back, I'm going to give you a few days to uh, relax. <laughs> but I appreciate it. Once you're up for it, we'll do a recap on this uh, to everyone listening. Go ahead and follow Ryan on Instagram at Beckett. I think that's what it is. Yeah. It's just my last name. Somehow I got that. I don't know how someone didn't take it, but I just, has anyone like ever it. offered you money for that Instagram handle all the time, all the time. Right. Cause I know the person that has the handle Zach, I've offered him, money for his but uh apparently he's gotten offers in like the six figures and i'm like geez dude you know i'm paying 100k for a handle but all right my dude well look enjoy the rest of your day enjoy the rest of your week uh safe travels and i look forward to hearing all the stories when you get back i appreciate man thanks for having me on the podcast so i caught up with ryan after his grand canyon 48 mile race and he had a lot to say about it it was actually extremely surprising what he had to say so here it is enjoy i'm uh gearing up for my iron man next week awesome and where's this one again this one's in tulsa oklahoma that's right awesome yeah man. Stoked? dude i'm so stoked i cannot wait really looking forward to it and uh we're gonna see how it goes the goal 17 hours not a minute faster love it so and but no dude, injuries or no nothing nagging you? Uh, I got a little nag in my hip, unfortunately, that just popped up about two and a half weeks ago. So um, doing a complete taper. I'm not even training at all until then. You know, I'm ready, right? I've been training for nine months. At this point, you know, it's just just waiting for race day, honestly. That's awesome. I always said taper was my strongest part of my program. <laughs> 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 Too funny, man. So, dude, you're back. You're alive, right? Mm. You made it. How did everything go? Uh, I'm. I barely made it back. <laughs> um, <laughs> I. Uh, I think I, first time we talked, I knew it was going to be challenging, and uh, I left room for it being more challenging than expected. But it was brutal. Um, the main reason it was brutal is because we were doing a lot of running training, like long distance. I was working in a little Stairmaster, you know, for elevation, you know, going up and whatever. Um, I decided to go with the trekking poles. That was a debate uh, amongst me and my my group. Um, thank God I did, which I'll explain in a, in a little bit. But um, basically, long story short, I think we underestimated a couple things. We underestimated how Florida boys were going to adjust to the altitude. Because mm -hmm. remember, the South Rim's 7,000 feet and the North Rim's <sighs> 9,000 feet. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been much higher than that on some things. And uh, I just, I just, I think we were all kind of taken off guard about how brutal the elevation was for us. Um, as good of shape as some of the guys on our team, team were. Um, the other thing I would say is that we couldn't run as much as we thought, meaning like when we were descending and ascending, uh, it, it's almost, and I know very professional trail runners have run it and, you know, crushed records and times and stuff like that. But we found it very challenging to run down a lot of it. And because of the altitude and the incline, we found it very challenging going up. You know, in the middle, when you're in the bottom, you could, uh, you know, kind of jog through some of the rollers and, and whatnot. But um, so all of that said, it took me, I think we were trying to go for 16 hours. It took us every bit of 22 hours to get it done. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it was amazing. I will say this, you know, for anyone that hasn't, any of your, your, your fans, your audience that hasn't been to the Grand Canyon, as great as technology is with uh, video and pictures, I can tell you 100%, and this was a consistent opinion amongst my group, it does not do justice to the Grand Canyon at all. When we first got off, the tr we took this old school train, I think I mentioned, from this little cowboy town of Williams up to uh, the South Rim where we camped. And uh, 
when you see the Grand Canyon for the first time, it almost is like otherworldly. It feels like something out of like Aliens or Avatar or whatever. It's it's absolutely breathtaking. So I, I've definitely appreciated why it's one of the seven natural wonders of the world. Uh, it's absolutely breathtaking. Dude, I got to get out there, man. For sure. It, 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 it's an amazing experience and I don't want to bore your audience with like all the little details, but I can tell you that uh, we started at three o'clock in the morning. Um, the guys in my group are, are crazy. And before we started the ultra, that is actually the Grand Canyon. Our campground is three miles from Bright Angel Trailhead. So just a cool 5k <laughs> before jogging to the trailhead. At, uh, <laughs> I was like, guys, can we get an Uber or something? We got 50 some miles ahead of us. Like we got really got a jog to the trailhead, but yeah, no other option. And uh, I probably would have blown my ankle five different times if I didn't have those trekking poles. And judging by how sore my arms were on the ascending, it actually helped a lot more than I thought too. Just like balance and everything like that. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, man, it was a it was a beautiful experience. I think most of the group hated me, uh, especially towards the end, since I was the one that talked everyone into uh, into the whole idea. But <laughs> I can tell you, you know, I think I made this analogy the first time we talked um, and recorded. You know, almost right away when you finish, everyone was like, "Man, what an experience!" I mean, it really. You know, if any of any of you that listen to David Goggins, he says reaching into the bat the bag of F word. I'm not sure if you can cuss on your podcast, <laughs> but, <laughs> but into the bag of F word, David Goggins says, and uh, I can tell you, we were deep in the bag because we wanted to go during the super moon, um, and we timed it uh, as such. And of course, the weather was gorgeous before we were there, and gorgeous after we were there, but. Murphy's Law, the two days we were there, it was freezing rain and snowing at the end. So we actually went a night what? early. Yeah. So when we were about 20 hours in, we still had about six miles left and climbing out of there. And it was the longest six miles in a couple hours, or however long it took, of my life. And it started freezing, raining. We had been, you know, doing it for, you know, approaching 24 hours. And uh, every step hurt, man. Every step hurt. And uh, we thought each one of us hit walls at different times. We peeled off into like a little bathroom off a little campsite and dumped the trash out of the trash cans and wore the trash bags as ponchos. (laughs) 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 And, uh, you know, we climbed our way out, man. I, uh, we got to the top. It was, uh, again, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, and uh, it wasn't flurry snowing. It was driving snow. So we actually uh, went into the bathrooms where they had the heat on a little bit, and we slept in the bathrooms until about 7 in the morning when people started coming in. <laughs> oh, my because, gosh. Yeah, man, because we still had a few miles to go to the campground. And I was like, man, do I want to sleep in a freezing tent? Like, And I can tell you, all of us, and some of the guys are in way better shape than I am, when, you, when we crawled out of the Grand Canyon, we really had nothing left. Um, so thank god those bathrooms were there and uh yeah man definitely not uh fancy at all we definitely uh pushed it and uh it was humbling and amazing all at the same time unreal dude so what is one thing that you learned about yourself through this entire process uh other than that i should probably have my head examined (laughs) (laughs) um you know, it's something that I already kind of knew, but, um, you know, I, I like taking myself out of my comfort zone because I think you grow as a person. Um, I really enjoyed on this one, actually, you know, because I've done stuff like Everest or Ironman that were organized by other people. But there was a part of me that really enjoyed being the organizer of this and encouraging friends, um, you know, a couple that work with me, you know, a couple that are younger you know, that it was a kind of a more out of their comfort zone than things that, you know, that kind of with my track record. And I really kind of um, enjoyed, I knew you do some life coaching. Um, it almost was like a microcosm of life coaching, if you will. And I found that like really rewarding because my one friend uh, at about almost 9,000 feet, the North Rim, he had a panic attack and he's never had a panic attack before. 
He thought he was having a heart attack. He laid down on the trail and we got him to finish the last little bit to the North Rim. And he was trying to get an Uber. And I was like, dude, wow. there's no Ubers here. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> there, you know, the only way you're getting out of here is walking. And he was done. And remind, remember, we're only halfway done now. I mean, we still have 25 miles and, you know, uh, left we've only and we're at nine thousand feet and uh he was trying to find every off-ramp metaphorically speaking possible he tried to convince a construction worker to bribe he was going to bribe the construction worker to ride back with him in his truck nothing was working i go listen man one step at a time there's another water stop in about an hour we can stop at we can check in with each other we're in no rush like i'll be right behind you and sure as hell, man, he finished strong. He finished right there with us, like 25 miles and 12, 10, 12 hours later. And I told him, and it was him that experienced it, but I experienced it with him. I just go, how powerful is the body and the mind? You thought halfway through the trip at 9,000 feet after a panic attack that you were done. You literally thought you were at the bottom of your reserves in your tank. And look at you now. You're struggling, sure, with the rest of us, but you're with the rest of us and you finished. And to me, like that felt really cool because even though it wasn't my accomplishment, I felt like I had like a, you know, a small part to play and I felt proud for him and stoked because, you know, that's really breaking through some barriers there. And I got to witness it and he's a good friend of mine. So I think that was really cool. And I think to directly answer your question, I kind of learned about myself that I appreciate that, if that makes sense. Unreal, dude. I, honestly, I'm really proud of you. And Thanks, man. Kudos to you for trying this, even in the first place, right? The fact that you guys actually completed it, and you know, you being—I don't want to say the leader, but like just keeping everyone level-headed throughout the entire trip and learning a lot about yourself and teaching your friends a lot about themselves as well. So that's really inspiring. I hope that anyone that's listening, you know, is inspired enough to take on a challenge maybe not as big as this because yes you do need your head examined for sure <laughs> but um dude that that's incredible man thanks man i, I we're gonna release a uh, uh one of the guys that went with us does some videography so we'll do a little short and i'll, I'll, I'll send you the link if you want to share it with them and we'll be probably like a little like five or six minute thing we do on our uh on our track we'll put together like the different videos and pictures that we took and if anyone is interested in doing it, I highly recommend there's a Facebook group that's rim to rim to rim. Um, it, they do it with the acronym R to R to R. Um, and uh, they were amazing. Anytime we had questions or needed advice or anything like that, that that Facebook group, group was really supportive. And, and you don't have to be a masochist like us, like just visiting the Grand Canyon. Some people just actually go south rim to north rim and then later in the spring they have a shuttle that can bring you back so there are other ways to experience it in a lot less masochistic way if anyone's interested unreal dude well i'm looking forward to that definitely share with me i'll share it to my audience beckett man you are a beast you're an animal keep doing your thing keep inspiring Thanks, and man. keep pushing your limits dude I appreciate it. I will say one of the things I learned is I think I'm good for a while on the bucket list masochistic adventures. You know, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure once the dust settles, I'll come up with another one and I'll probably be trying to talk you into it to do it with me as well. Um, but I think for now, I'm good. I'm good for a while. I can definitely confidently say that. <laughs> Love it, dude. Good awesome. stuff, my guy. Well, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank Wish you. me luck in the Iron Man, dude. And I'll be following I'm... you. I'll be live tracking you. I hope your audience does too. It's a it's a fun thing to do to cheer on friends, and I'll be live tracking you on the Iron Man website. And I'm really stoked for you to have the experience, and I know you're going to crush it. Like I said, you know, I'm glad you framed the time goal the way you did when we began uh, the recording because. I think that that's really important for you to enjoy it um, and soak it in, man. Thanks, dude. Appreciate yeah. it. Well, yeah. uh, we will definitely connect soon. We got to get out there and play tennis at some point. I'm in. Yeah, I guess you can take my lunch money anytime next time we play. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good, bro. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, brother.